so uh, I think we'll get started, but um, so what I'm here to talk about today is carbon farming and specifically how our farm came into being and is partnered with a craft brewing company. So um, the thing that I would really, really hope um, could come out of me like sharing this story as widely as possible is both other young farmers um, finding ways to partner with uh, green businesses and ultimately having that turn into opportunities for land ownership, for tenure, for um, really sovereignty for small farms. Um, and that's what uh, got, that's what happened with us, which was kind of an amazing uh, journey. But um, I guess the first thing that I'll go through is, um, this is North Coast Brewing Company. They're a certified B Corporation, um, a registered uh, benefit corporation. Um, that's Stellar Sea Lion. Um, we, uh, one of our, our projects that we do, partners, um, is we have Stellar IPA that a percentage of the sales uh, goes to supporting marine mammal research and rescue. Um, so they've been around, they're actually founded the year that I was born. So they've been around a long time. Surge in the B Corp community and the idea of sustainable um, business and sustainable economies. Um, they're kind of a, an, an original player in, in that. So everybody, has everybody in here heard of B Corps? No, okay, so a B Corporation, B Corp is basically um, a third party um, organization that has a point system for um, how companies can benefit um, the environment, their employees, the community, and the world, basically. So um, some B Corps focus really heavily on like, you know, worker ownership and um, some focus really heavily on um, more environmental, um, you know, programs. So North Coast Brewing Company, as as a brewery, I mean, beer is an agricultural product, and it's easy to kind of forget about that because it's several steps removed. You know, beer isn't really made out of uh, barley; it's made out of malt. So you have this, um, you have this kind of uh, craft within crafts. Um, it's a, a pretty refined art that I don't understand at all. <laughs> but so North Coast Brewing Company is uh, a certified B Corp. And um, independent since 1988 um, is not um, owned by any larger beer conglomerate. Um, we are non-GMO project verified on our core beers, which um, there are very, very few breweries that um, have the non-GMO project verification. It's a super, super rigorous process. Um, so that's really exciting, that's really new. Um, and this is Fortunate Farm. <laughs> so um, our, our partnership with uh, North Coast Brewing Company started when I was managing a farm to school program nearby in Fort Bragg. And I started experimenting with composting the spent grain and hops from the brewery. Um, just because I'm a compost dork and I love composting and I love worms and I was coming from a 150 acre row crop farm um, in outside Portland, Oregon back to my home uh, in Mendocino to run this program just a super intensive two acre farm that served 1800 kids. So it was kind of a big world change and one of the things that I wanted to kind of bring with me from Portland was you know, this idea of like, okay, how do we manage our own fertility on farm when you're going from a big farm where you can do things like large scale cover crops, rotations, down to like a small, you know, more urban style farm. So I started experimenting with that. We, we got to the point pretty quickly where it became clear that there was just a huge opportunity to scale up that production. Um, ultimately, what ended up happening is um, North Coast Brewing Company um, approached me and said, well, when you want to go bigger, let us know, and we'll figure out a way to do that. So initially, I started looking for land to lease that would be nearby, that we could grow, grow food on, that we could make compost on. Um, the, the farmer who owned this farm was born on the land, 
Um, he had farmed there for his whole life. He had had a certified organic CSA way back in the day. Um, and he was retired. And I had known him from the community. I'd known, I'd known him from the farmer's market. Um, he used to work a lot in uh, the kind of like local ag um, policy. Um, and he approached us and said, hey, I, I hear you're looking for land. Could you buy my farm? And essentially, we said, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, At the time, I was 25. I had never had a commercial credit card. I've still never had a commercial credit card. My only credit history was from paying student loans. Um, and I worked for a nonprofit farm to school program. You know, I didn't have the kind of money that it takes to buy land on the California coast. Um, so initially, we thought, well, maybe I could get away with leasing the field while it's for sale, and we could do some stuff there. And I went and talked to North Coast Brewing Company about it, and they were like, well, why don't we try to buy it? So ultimately, what we did is um, we co-own the farm. So um, my family and I used a farm service agency loan um, to purchase part of the farm, and North Coast Brewing Company purchased the other part, and then I manage the whole farm collectively. So. <laughs> So that's a huge, huge example of sustainable business actually putting their money where their mouth is to support local economy and support local farmers. And you know, really, that that land access would never have happened without them. How much land is it? It's forty acres total. So it's a forty-acre farm, and we're uh, a little under four miles away from the brewery. So. Um, Development of a carbon farm plan in one way or another um, was pretty central to this whole idea from the beginning. So this isn't all of the farm. Um, this is a slice that we're managing the most intensively right now. There's pastures and um, you know other stuff going on. There's a big ag pond kind of further to the north where this is cut off. But I wanted to zoom in on this so you could get an idea of kind of what we're looking at. Um, you know, now that we've we've been there now for for um, since spring of 2014, so it's still um, it's still a pretty recent. But what what we've done with the farm is use satellite mapping software um, to parcel it out into into plots. So um, all of our planting plots have standardized sizing. So it's either 40 by 100 or 40 by 200. And each of those has a 10-foot hedgerow strip between them. So we have um, a 10-foot hedgerow strip that we're planting with um, trees, uh, pollinator plants. Um, we're partnering with the, the NRCS to do that. So both native and non-native um, species. So we have somewhere for pollinators, beneficial insects, mason bees, bird nests. Um, I'm, that's my favorite thing that we're, we're doing right now is getting to plant and plant these. We've planted this upper section, and then we're still working on a lot of this lower section. So, um, And then these kind of big diagonal um, bars that look like big boomerangs across the farm represent some large-scale windbreaks. Um, a lot of the area in here, we're working on um, pasture redevelopment, um, we're working on planned grazing. Um, so when we first started, the idea was, OK, we're going to take this farm. It's been in agriculture for over 100 years. Um, the history of the, the, the family that farmed here is almost identical to my family's history. Um, that was also on the Mendocino coast, although about an hour further south, where they were Europeans who came to California over 100 years ago um, and operated a truck farm right near a big um, lumber port. Um, so actually, my great-great-grandparents' farm is still in operation uh, down on the south coast of Mendocino. It's been a community farm for about 30 years, since right before I was born. Um, and so I kind of feel like, as, as part of like this like legacy of um, like the, the colonization and subsequent resource extraction of the California coast, um, being able to come into a landscape like this 
that is full of invasive species, that has very little soil organic matter, um, that's been overgrazed, that's covered in gorse, because the family that settled there were from Cornwall. <laughs> so they brought gorse with them, so we have like 12 foot high gorse everywhere. Um, t to me, it's, it's, it's a, it feels like this, I mean, it's, it's a very like, there, there's no like non, it's really like, it feels like a spiritual calling to me. It's like really like how, how do we as people who work and live on land, who want to be supported by it, who want to support our community with it, how do we use that unbelievable privilege of getting to impact land with our work to actually affect healing? So one of, one of the things that, that we're doing is we're, go we're going to be the first vegetable farm in Mendocino County history to have a formal carbon farm plan. Um, and it's actually in its final stages of editing right now. So that will exist as a, as a document um, with the Resource Conservation District that we can then come back and, and um, verify our progress throughout the years. And, um, partnering with Fiber Shed has been a big part of that. Aaron's been a big part of that. Um, but the kind of heart and soul of our farm is our on-farm composting. So this is an example of, you know, this, that's me on the tractor. This is a shot in the spring where we were coming into a field that is basically sand. <laughs> We've got um, a sandy coastal prairie soil that had been overgrazed. Um, so very little soil organic matter. And um, we're essentially composting in place. So if we go back to this, to this slide, each of these field sections um, has rotational compost in it. So rather than have a compost pad that's concrete, that we make all our compost in one spot that's just wrecked, and then move it to other places to improve those places, the idea is how do we integrate our compost production into the farm so that we're not creating a sacrifice zone for the benefit of everywhere else. It's like we all kind of talk about in regenerative agriculture how great the benefits of applying compost are, whether it's on rangeland or on cropland, <laughs> but we kind of need to solve that problem of, of how do we produce compost in a way that's actually environmentally beneficial. Um, so uh, <laughs> there's some fun uh, equipment that goes with it. Um, so. This is the, um, a better view of kind of the back of, of the windrow turner. So this is actually, believe it or not, it is the smallest windrow turner on the market. Wow. Um, it's an MM80 by Frontier, and it's my baby. Um, we, we had to do some custom metal fabrication to actually make it work with this tractor, but um, it makes a windrow that's about, a, a windrow is just a word for a long, row of compost. So rather than having one compost pile, our compost looks like a big long rectangle. So um, those blades um, spin around <laughs> at um, super high RPMs. They actually put in 15 pounds of oxygen for every pound of material that they go through, mm -hmm. which when you're composting a really dense material is really important. Um, it was actually designed for composting dairy manure. Um, which is a really like high moisture, high nitrogen, low carbon to nitrogen ratio material. Um, so it works really well for that. The tank on top um, allows us to either rehydrate a compost that's drying out or add an inoculant. Um, you can see it's offset behind to the side of the tractor. How um, I've done some stuff with this thing that um, the manufacturer did not design it for. <laughs> um, we really off-road it. We, there's some like some. Uh, there's a Mad Max element to uh, to what we do at Fortunate Farm, um, but it's actually um, it's it's managed to um, produce compost on site and fit into areas where you wouldn't necessarily think that you could fit on farm compost production. Um, oh, and the, the tractor is um, a Kubota, and it actually has a diesel particulate filter where it captures and reburns its own exhaust. Um, and then eventually, after recycling, um, stabilizes it so that you can take it in for disposal. So it's actually really cool after 
kind of spending a lot of years on on farms where there's just a lot of black smoke in everybody's face when uh, heavy equipment work is going on to, to see a tractor that it's running and there's not a big spoon of black smoke coming out. So that's very, very cool. And the hydrostatic transmission is actually really important to being able to run this machine too. So I don't know how, I don't know if there are any heavy equipment dorks in the room, so that information might not be like entirely relevant, but as a heavy equipment dork, this stuff is really great. And specifically, um, it's actually relatively affordable technology. So this, this winter turner um, costs $18,000, which to me is an enormous amount of money. And I'm sure to almost all of us here is an enormous amount of money. But when you consider that the, the next size up on the market that's being sold is both twice this size and is more depending on the company and depending on the features, you're looking at more like fifty to eighty thousand dollars. This is very affordable technology. Um, so when you think about um, other other companies that are producing green byproducts, um, juice companies, uh, tea companies, um, really any any processed. Um, product that is using an organic input, that's generating an organic output, this is a feasible way of, of safely composting it. So this is some of the stuff that we've done with it. Um, this was our first field. Um, I initially was, um, was really wanting to do all of our, our compost windrow production on contour. So some of these contour, these, these uh, windrows have actually already been knocked down by the time this picture was taken. So I'm starting to plant them. But where this, where this was, this is now a perennial flower garden. So um, that's been a, a really cool transition. Um, so this is one of the more hammered areas on the farm. So we decided, OK, let's make compost there. Um, let's make compost there a couple times. And then let's plant it with perennials that we may not disturb again for several years. You know, it's mostly planted with dahlias, which we inherited from Stuart. Um, he, he grew dahlias for cut flowers at the farmer's market after he retired from vegetable production. So we had his original bulb stock that we divided. So we have to pull them and divide them every now and again, but it's still like minimal disruption to kind of let that, that land heal. It's, um, it was CSA farmed for a long time. Um, so, you know, the soil organic matter there was very, very low when we started. And we're now up at over 6% um, just across the tractor path from this photo. So I think just like about 20 feet from there um, was where we initially sampled. And uh, that's really, really exciting because that's, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's really fun. Um, so this is its former life as a compost production site. And it's now a uh, perennial dahlia garden that we run as a U-pick on the weekends. So we have like lots of kids running around in there picking dahlias. So, so you don't add any more after, after that? That's no, we haven't come back in after that. Um, so our, our soil being a sandy soil, um, Really, I, I kind of feel like soil organic matter, it's like really no matter what your issue is, organic matter is your solution. If you have heavy clay soil that doesn't infiltrate water very well, then you want to add organic matter to increase its porosity. If you have really sandy soil that water just drops out the bottom of like we do, then you want to add organic matter to increase its ability to absorb and hold water. So our soil has a pretty darn fast metabolism. It really churns through organic matter really quickly. So there are a few areas where we've applied compost and grown crops that we've come back to and reapplied compost. But most of our perennial areas, we really haven't. Uh, we'll make compost on a site, harvest off the top layer of the compost, and then spread what's left and plant it, and then move on. Um, I think we probably will come back and reapply compost in later years, but um, not at a heavy rate. Um, it seems like if, if you can... Um, give the system kind of a, a knock in the right direction, um, there's, there's a real tendency to snowball in nature, both positively and negatively. 
you know, if you start um, a degenerative system, it has a tendency to pick up speed and degenerate on its own even after you stop messing with it. And the same is also true of a regenerative system. So it's not that there'll never be disruption again, but we probably won't ever go in again with heavy equipment. Um, so for an, an example, uh, this field on the right, you can see that hedge in the background, that's gorse, probably eight feet tall. It's got roots that are this big around or bigger. Um, it's like if Scotch Broom had a heavy metal older brother. <laughs> it's got giant thorns on it. Um, it's full of volatile oil, which means it burns really easily and burns really hot. And its roots are so big and also full of volatile oil that it can actually burn underground. Um, I actually really love this plant. I feel like its, um, it's, it's position here is very karmic. And it's also kind of like the dark twin of the fava bean, you know, <laughs> where we all know about like what's a cover crop. A cover crop is stabilizing soil, it's preventing erosion, it's adding nitrogen, it's increasing biodiversity of the soil, it's doing all of these things. This has been incredibly effective at keeping people out of areas. <laughs> it's incredibly effective at stabilizing hillsides. It flowers in the winter, so it's, a, it's great for bees. Um, it's fixing nitrogen. Um, you can make a really nice dye for wool out of its flowers. Um, you can make wine out of its flowers. And right below my cabin, there's currently a family of foxes that are very, very happily nesting in it because nothing is going to mess with them in there. Um, they're teenagers now, and they're really cute. They bounce around. Um, so I don't, I don't hate this plant. Um, a lot of people up on the north coast where this plant is, which you know, might not, none of you guys may have ever experienced this, but there's a lot of negative feelings about this plant. It's very spiny. It isn't a very good neighbor. It, it, um, it's hard to live with. Um, but what we found is that the, the response to it has really encouraged it. So what people have done with this plant for the last 50 years is burn it, poison it, and till it. Um, OK, so let's talk about that. This is a first colonizing invasive. It's a nitrogen fixer. What's it like? What does it want? Yeah, so it doesn't want fungi. It wants a bacterially dominated soil. It, so great, so tilling it, ripping it out, burning it, all of that's going to kill fungi. Um, exposed soil becomes bacterial soil because like, not much else can survive in the top layer of soil that's torn up like that. Turns out burning it, it actually likes that. It actually helps the seeds germinate. <laughs> and um, it's like a coppice plant. That's what, what it's used for in Cornwall, for sheep fencing, because literally it, it just, you mow it and it regrows. So it doesn't seem to mind Roundup very much. <laughs> so you spray Roundup on it, and it'll kill down the top of the plant, and then it'll just sprout right back up the next time it rains. So no, nothing that anybody is, has used um, using those techniques has kept gorse from completely taking over everything. So this is a typical pasture on Fortunate Farm when we moved there. So you can see that the field is bonsai gorse. The flat part of the field that's been mowed has just bonsai. The plants are just flat along the ground, but they're still flowering. They're still making seeds. They don't particularly mind that either. Um, the giant tall gorse is around the riparian areas, um, which I have actually sunk a tractor in, because the gorse is so thick and big that you can't tell where the drop-offs are. So l let me tell you, like, fall hole on top of a 1975 Massey Ferguson um, with no diff lock isn't fun. It's not great. So like this, this plant has really bothered a lot of people in Casper for a long time. So what our response to it has been, so this is a, a similar field <laughs> now, um, is to just switch things up. OK, we know, we know burning doesn't work. We know pulling it out doesn't work. We know poisoning it doesn't work. So what doesn't this invasive plant want? So if you start thinking about weeds as a consequence of soil biology, they're thinking about weeds as a consequence of land management. So if I'm, if I'm a nitrogen fixer, if I'm an aggressive land-grabbing nitrogen fixer, 
what don't I want? I don't want competition. I don't want nitrogen. I don't want fungi. I don't want shade. I don't want all those things, right? Um, this plant is like nature's Band-Aid, right? You know, if you, you rip something up, it, oh, quick, stick that on it and cover it. So we've actually had a huge amount of success with no glyphosate and no burning um, instead of just using uh, compost and cover crops. We've now got um, over a quarter of the farm almost entirely gorse free, where we still make it the occasional plant that comes up in the pasture, but there's no big mono stands of it. It's learned how to get along with everybody and be a nice member of the community. Um, and actually, when it grows in community, when it grows up in a pasture and it's not the dominant only thing there, it's actually a great plant. It doesn't get as hard and sharp and spiny when it's in the shade, which means it's a legume and the sheep love to eat it. Um, it still has that great deep root system. There's lots of love about it. So it just needs to be reminded of how to get along with everybody else. And I think that that's, that approach to kind of ecosystem management when you come into degraded land that is overrun with invasive species, it would be nice to see um, adopted more generally by the community because a lot of our aggressive responses to trying to take it out really just kind of mirror the conditions that caused it to be there in the first place. Um, yeah, so almost all, of, almost all of Casper, our entire town, um, which is a boom town, a logging town. It was owned by pretty much one family. And the Casper Cattle Company, you know, ran cows on it. And so it was this, this very, um, not the best model of land management. So now that, you know, we've had a few years under our belt, you know, of course the first thing that I wanted to do is plant fruit trees and plant perennials. But my fear was, of species issues, and we plant a whole bunch of trees, they're just going to be swallowed in 12 foot, foot gorse. So um, after a couple of years of cover cropping, compost mm -hmm. application, getting things under control, we've now come in and started planting perennials. Um, so these are our cute baby fruit trees. Mm -hmm. So we um, partnered with, and I, I don't know if many people know that you can do this. I mean, how many people here are, like plant fruit trees at, at your house or at your farm or your garden? Probably a, a lot of us. So it turns out that grafting is really easy. Um, you can learn how to graft things on the internet for free, like we did. Um, there's also amazing classes and books and awesome stuff. Um, but if you're broken in a hurry, there's YouTube. Um, or a friend that knows how to graft. Um, and root stocks in bundles of 50, um, these cost $2 a piece. So we got 100 of them. So we spent $200, bought 100 root stocks. As everybody here knows how fruit trees work, they need to you know, have your scion wood and your root stock. They don't propagate from seeds. Um, but what we found is that when we cut the top of the root stock off to graft the scion on, and then we just stuck those in a planting bed, they just happily rerooted. So now we have 200 fruit trees, right? Our scion wood, which is the part that goes in top that actually makes the apples that you want to eat. So, well, apples and, and plums, we got 50 of each. We got for free. Um, the California Rare Fruit Growers um, hosts a series of seed and scion exchanges in the fall and winter. And I'm sure that there's, I mean, I know that there's a bunch in Sonoma. I'm sure that there's some down here. Golden Gate chapter. Golden Gate chapter, right. So for a really very low cost and for devoting maybe a half an hour to some YouTube tutorials um, or supporting you know, a local fruit tree grower by paying them to take a class with them, um, you can produce your own fruit trees. And it might take them five, six years to fruit, but we've got time, right? Um, so if you compare that to like the 20 or $30 that it would cost to like buy these at a nursery at a couple years old, that, that makes it, it possible for us to plan on as many fruit trees as we are. Yay! So <laughs> this is our first beehive <laughs> coming to the farm. And we've since been capturing swarms, and now we have a whole bunch of them. Uh, these are two of my farm partners. That's Megan and Cameron. Um, they're both brilliant people. 
Megan um, is a mycologist and her real interest is in uh, cultivating mushrooms and plants together. So she has a, um, we have an oyster mushroom tomato project going on right now. And we also have um, wine cap, strafaria, and everything tree project going on right now. Um, we have a grove of olive trees that are all inoculated with wine cap strafaria that are doing really, really well. And then we're propagating out the strafaria spawn to add to our hedgerows. We have some that are already inoculated. Um, we want to try the hug next, um, which is essentially, it's, um, it's a fungi perfecti strain of what's pretty much an oyster mushroom that's pretty uh, adaptable and resilient to living in garden systems. So that's, that's her thing that she focuses on. Um, and Cameron is a beekeeper, and he came to us from um, an urban bee swarm rescue. Um, they're great. I love them. Um, this is Glenda the Beautiful. So we have about 25, 30 sheep at any given time. Um, that we rotationally graze throughout the farm. Um, typically, like a, a system for us might look like mowing gorse, grazing the gorse, tilling the gorse, because you can't run um, a seed planter through one inch thick roots. It's a good way to break really expensive equipment. Um, and then planting an annual cover crop, grazing the annual cover crop, planting an annual cover crop again, grazing it again, then planting a perennial pasture mix. So our rotation to get to the point where we have like developed pasture, we're looking, it's like multiple years. It's, it takes a long time, but these are our, our lovely little workhorses that do that. Um, here's my meal. Um, and we're partnered with Fibershed. So Fibershed is an amazing um, organization. Uh, they do a lot of work down here. Um, down here. I think of this all as like basically Marin, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're Fiber Shed producer members, and um, Rebecca Burgess, who's just unbelievably brilliant, um, is, is part of that organization. And it's amazing getting, getting to work with her. If you ever get an opportunity to hear her speak, um, jump on it. She's brilliant. Um, so uh, some of the stuff that we do with the sheep, we do rotational grazing with the sheep. Um, I also teach um, hand shearing um, a couple times a year, um, which is not electric shearing. It's the big, the big scissors, those things. Um, so part of the, the reason f for that is it's, it's really just keeping old skills alive. And also, you know, when, when you shear with hand shears, you don't need a generator. You don't need to move sheep to where there's electricity. Um, the equipment is cheap. It's my body and a pair of shears, um, which means like it's easy to fix. It's easy to carry around. But it also means that it, it keeps that skill set in the community, um, rather than having a couple shearers who um, end up really being really overstretched. Um, that combined with like a really low value in the current wool market means most people just really don't grow wool anymore. My family um, did for a really long time um, down on Sea Ranch, and there's still a um, there's a Sea Ranch flock that's doing fire breaks, kind of like what um, BCB was talking about. Um, so we still like on on my great great grandparents' farm, we still mulch the beds with belly cuts in the winter and stuff, and. That's kind of what we're here doing too. So um, this is kind of the, the full cycle part of this. So you know, we raise the sheep on the farm. Um, this picture over here is, you know, that's, that was that really pretty black ram. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's, it's pretty magical to have um, a blanket or a garment that you know, the sheep was born on the farm only ever ate grass and gorse in its whole life, was shorn on the farm, washed, carded, spun, and wove on the farm. So you have this, this finished thing that's never left the farm um, from, from one end to the other. And to me, that's really pretty magical. And it's another way that our farm can kind of give back to the community. So um, this, this picture was from a, um, 
a big spinning workshop that we did where we uh, were members of the Pacific Textile Arts Guild. So we r rented a whole bunch of wheels and just did a big fiber day. So we had a bunch of veteran uh, fiber people and then a whole bunch of newbies and sheared a sheep and kind of went from there. So it's, it's fun to, to get to do that stuff. A lot of what um, my focus is and what I feel really kind of like privileged to get to do is to look at how do we adapt farming on our scale in our place to, to the really re the reality that we need to minimize tillage to minimize erosion to be able to keep farming and keep eating in the future. Like, that's really key. Um, I think Elizabeth Kaiser is speaking mm -hmm. tomorrow. She's amazing. I totally recommend um, hearing her talk. She's going to be probably more specifically focused on no-till than I am. I, what I really want to do is kind of give a, an overview of how to pull these elements in, um, ideally for other farmers and green business people. But um, our model and the Singing Frogs model are different in some really key ways. Um, they're farming about three acres actively. We're on a 40 acre farm, we're growing vegetables on about 10 acres, we're grazing about 20 acres, then we have about 10 acres of central buildings and roads and big pond and stuff. So that's our active space. Um, so it's a, bigger, it's a bigger farm and we're also in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, we can't, uh, we can't charge retail prices that are in the, the urban periphery where we have, you know, um, more urban incomes, basically. Um, that doesn't really work for our farm's model. Um, the amount of labor we have doesn't really work. There's, there's five of us that farm um, on a 40-acre farm. And with everything that goes into that, um, grazing and livestock and vegetable production and compost production. Um, so you know, having about an average of 15 people at any given time um, for three acres like they do wouldn't work for us either. It wouldn't work for us economically to pay people to do it. Um, the housing wouldn't work. We're, you know, we don't have the ability to house that many people on farm. They also wouldn't be able to find rental housing locally. Um, so we have to be able to adapt these no-till and minimal-till methods that work on an intermediate scale farm. So one of the things, if anybody caught David R. Montgomery's talk, um, he's so great. He was on my radio show. He's awesome. Um, and we, we got kind of got into that when, when I got the chance to interview him. Um, I do a once a month radio show about farming. Um, so we got to kind of talk about that and that for, for him finding intermediate scale organic farms that are actually able to implement some of these practices, it's especially in California where cover crops have a tendency to just pop right back up and keep growing after you <laughs> roller crimp them, um, and where we don't have killing frosts, um, that that's kind of the, the unicorn right now. No-till works on a highly, 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 highly labor-intensive, specialized, small scale when you have the ability to sell at a high enough price point to an affluent enough market to support that level of labor input. And it works on a giant scale, where you have big, giant machines like huge no-till drills and power crimpers. Um, we don't have any of that. So how do we make it work? So for us, some of the things that we have trialed, um, we've used occultation, which is where you can get a hold of these silage tarps. Um, they're big, thick, heavy UV-treated uh, poly tarps. Um, you can usually find them used because um, people that are using them to ferment silage, once they get a couple holes in them, they're no longer usable. Whereas we can still use them for this just fine. So we'll grow up a cover crop. Um, and I've experimented both with mowing it down and leaving it standing and just tarping over it to kill it back that way. So instead of putting herbicide on it, we just light deprive it and then plant right back through that. That's actually been really effective. That's actually worked really well. Um, the downside is that, you know, you need to have a big plastic tarp, but these are things that exist in our world that we can find recycled that, I mean, I could potentially keep using for indefinitely. They're big, gnarly tarps, and if you take care of them, they'll last a long time. So something like that, um, that's worked. 
So I, I actually feel like I liked tarping down the standing cover crop better as far as the finished surface because when you pull the tarp off, it just looks like you put down straw mulch. You know, it's it's so perfect and like it just lays down after a couple of days and it's this perfect mulch surface. Whereas when you uh, flail mow it, it almost, um, especially in the spring and fall when there's more moisture in the soil, it almost biodegrades too quickly. Um, and it's, it's chunkier and you kind of get more weed pop through. Um, but if it's windy and you're trying to tarp down something, like we have like a couple of days that are the circus tent phase, um, where it's just like sandbags and the, you know, if, if a gust of wind gets between the sandbags, you're gonna have like a 40 by 200 foot tarp flying, wow. which you really don't want. That's, that's not fun. So um, it, it all kind of depends on when and where. Um, I've also found that flail mowing can actually, I sometimes don't like the, um, you have to be really careful with it. it. It can almost create some compaction or some stubbliness that's hard to plant back through, wherein like the folded down cover crop is easier to transplant through. Um, we can't really, um, what I would love to do, and something that's been interesting about doing no-till on this scale is, you know, David R. Montgomery in his book, um, Growing Revolution talks about how there's actually a pretty big cost savings with going no-till for conventional farmers that are doing grain growing. And he showed that in his, um, in his presentation today too. Um, for vegetable farmers, it's actually quite the opposite. Um, if you already have a tractor, you can get a rototiller for like two grand. If you wanna be really fancy, much cultivation, you can get a plastic mulch layer for like another 2,500 bucks. And that's it, you're done. You know, you, that, that's your equipment. You can farm with that. And many, many, many people do. Whereas for us to do this effectively, um, like uh, uh, Jean-Martin Fortier, um, he uses a BCS, but he really loves using a uh, power harrow. Elliot Coleman does too. And that's a piece of equipment that it spins um, parallel to the ground. So it just creates a seed bed without actually rolling over and creating a plow pan. I would love to get a hold of one of those. I haven't found one cheaper than six or seven grand. Um, our equipment looks like, um, I might use like a chisel plow to come through an area that um, either has been compacted previously because it was previously farmed or to pull out gorse roots. We have an 80 year old spring tine harrow, which is very hard to get parts for that if we're gonna direct seed like carrots, um, we'll bring that over the top to try to make a seed bed um, without turning over soil. Um, but for us to kind of have the full, the full no-till spread, um, I costed it out one time and I came up with something like $30,000 between a compost spreader mulcher, a water wheel transplanter, um, the rotary power harrow, um, all that stuff is expensive. You know, a no-till drill might run you between eight and twelve thousand dollars. So, you know, these giant mega farms are already doing that. But for us in California, who are trying to grow sustainable food on a scale of between five and twenty acres, it's pretty tough for us right now. So, what part of what I'm hoping we can do, especially through the carbon farm plan and through our own agonizing experience over the next several years is develop some protocols that work that can be adopted to other places. So far, um, cover cropping and then tarping, super effective. Um, so this is really fun. That's some of that wine capture fairy I was telling you about. And these are um, sunflowers and potatoes. Cool. They were intercropped together and They've never had any irrigation. Um, and that's what we've, what we've seen. So the, this farm used to run out of water every summer because of how much they had to irrigate because of how sandy the soil is. And now we're able to take crops to full maturity with zero water. And it's really just entirely compost application, um, soil microbiomes that are flourishing. And I think Last slide, 
Healthy soil means really beautiful produce. So um, we are really loving this. <laughs> we actually had to switch our ordering procedures on the, um, the wholesale food hub that we use because um, our heads of lettuce on average weighed three times as much as the other large farm that was selling to the same distributor. So <laughs> our, our counts ended up being off and we'd get orders that wouldn't fit in a box. So we had to switch to doing everything per pound instead of per head. Um, so it's, it's been so fa fantastic. Also, we learned how to make flower crowns, and now we all wear flower crowns. <laughs> so it's, it's been really spectacular. And our kind of um, full picture is we start with the organic byproducts that come out of North Coast Brewing Company. We compost <laughs> them on farm. We grow the produce on farm, and then we bring the beer to the farm and get to enjoy them all together. And as time goes on and we can kind of develop that infrastructure more and more, that's, that's what I really love getting to see. And so really, if um, we have our sustainability report here, it's also available on the internet because I only have a few copies if you want to see it. It goes way more into what's going on at North Coast Brewing Company. I'm their sustainability manager. I do that 30 hours a week, and then the rest of the time I'm at Fortunate Farm. Um, I could really keep going forever, but I think um, I think that that's where we'll leave it. But seriously, if you're in um, green business, if you are working with an organic waste product, if you're a small farmer and you have questions about incorporating on-farm composting, I always love to talk about it. So feel free to reach out, and I've got cards up here too. Does anybody have any questions? So um, our two big compost feedstocks are chipped dead Monterey pines from the farm and spent grain from North Coast Brewing Company. We're actually still working through windfall dead Monterey pines. They're a non-native tree that was planted on the farm historically that are now mostly dead and lying on the ground. Um, so we're <laughs> composting that mixed with uh, the spent grain. At any given time, we'll have about 100 yards active, like active meaning over 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and probably several hundred more yards that are curing um, or that we're storing. Um, so, I mean, we, we produce a fair amount of compost. We fall under CalRecycle's exemption for on-farm composting in terms of our scale and our feedstocks. Um, I don't want to start getting into compost regulations because that's really long, but essentially um, we are not using any municipal waste, anything post-consumer, anything animal generated, so no manure, and that gives us the ability to be more flexible about our volume and about what we're using and how we're using it. So, so uh, you know, it's a tractor scale compost. It's, it's a fairly large amount of compost. It takes us about a half an acre to manage our, our compost at a time. And then we move that around. Um, so far, not really, just because of the amount of labor required to transform the gorse into a compostable form. Somebody would have to cut it down with a chainsaw and feed it into a chipper, which I'd rather just mow it and then let sheep eat it. Um, it actually, though, if we were doing more of a hand scale, it would probably make a great compost input just because it's, it's a nitrogen fixer and it's a ton of biomass. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you have to do to it before the sheep can graze on it? Nothing. The regrowth, that, it's a coppice plant, and the regrowth that comes up is really soft. And they love it. They're very happy to eat it. So, yeah. It's more about keeping the equipment alive that's mowing it because it's some of those roots are huge and backing over it with a flail mower can be a little dangerous for equipment and people. But yeah, thank you. Yeah.